Hello everyone. This is yet another episode of Career Talks by Welcome Solutions. And in these meetings, we talk with uh, professionals uh, with interesting career paths who share their life hacks with us. And I have a great pleasure to introduce Dr. Matteo Tardelli today. Uh, Dr. Matteo Tardelli is a postdoctoral scientist at Whale Cornell Medicine in uh, NYC and the author of the book, The Salmon Leap for PhDs, Swimming Upstream a Career from Academia to Industry. To date, apart from doing science, he has assisted many researchers in gaining the confidence to launch new and diverse careers by taking part in career panels and volunteering for scientific communities. Uh, thank you for, uh, so much for joining us today, Matteo. Um, great to meet you, finally in person. Yeah, happy uh, to be here. Thanks yeah, we know me. each other from the uh, from the social media and from yeah, yeah the online cloud. Uh, but this is the first time we have a chance to speak uh, in person, so I'm very happy to see you. Yeah, just very nice. Thank you again for accepting the invitation, and I'm very curious how it all started for you. So. Could you tell us a bit about your career all the way from PhD to uh, where you, you are now? Sure, absolutely. So uh, I started my PhD uh, in uh, Vienna, in Austria, um, you know, back in Europe. And uh, the, the PhD was, was like a very good time, like back in the days. Um, I was doing research within adipose tissue inflammation and uh, this kind of stuff uh, in regards to uh, type 2 diabetes and obesity. So it was a little bit of a mix between immunology and, uh, you know, metabolism kind of stuff. So um, after that, what happened was that uh, I finished my PhD and I was, I didn't really know what to do afterwards. And uh, a collaboration came up uh, just before I was done with it. And, uh, and that was from, uh, from another lab just within the same institution. So uh, at some point um, they decided uh, to basically get me and that was uh, basically my, the start of my first uh, postdoc. So it was still at the Vienna Gen General Hospital, uh, but you know, just uh, in another lab basically. And uh, this other lab was really more focused uh, still on uh, metabolism and uh, um, uh, you know kind of um, uh, diseases connected to uh, nutrition and uh, overnutrition in uh, in practice, but uh, with a focus on uh, the liver disease basically. So um, it was a little bit of something different, but very interesting. Uh, yeah. So after my my uh, this first postdoc, I really wanted to um, you know have an experience in the US. Um, so. Uh, what happened was I was I was in a meeting in San Francisco presenting some um, some science and then uh, you know approached what uh, it was gonna be my my new boss in New York City and uh, I will always remember the interview uh, process there <laughs> it was like uh, on a walk from a poster session to a talk session and that, that was my my kind of interview uh, like on the way to to this talk so it was really like uh, very informal and. And uh, very nice. And uh, uh, my my former boss um, was was very supportive with that. So um, what happened was I started my uh, second postdoc in April uh, 2019. And so I moved to New York City. I started like a completely new life, and it was really interesting. I mean, the experience itself was was pretty amazing. And uh, uh, you know, some people will tell you many times that during your postdoc you don't really learn a lot of stuff. But I think it wasn't the case for me. I mean, it was a really like massive learning curve uh, in the first in the first year and also the second year. But um, what already back in the days was something that was you know up in my head a little bit uh, was that I really wanted to start a transition within industry. I really understood the fact that uh, probably not wanting to be a PI in grant, uh, you know, was, was something that. You know, it didn't make a lot of sense for me to stay in academia, right? So just to do like to jump from one postdoc to the other. So there was just to give you a little bit of a background, there was really like something that was already like in my mind, like already when I started uh, the second postdoc. So this was something uh, interesting, but anyway, I enjoyed I enjoyed the second postdoc uh, very much uh, until. Um, COVID hit, of course, <laughs> like for everyone, it was a bit of a, a kind of wake up call, right? 
So I really decided to invest more time into uh, finding uh, a little bit and informing myself on uh, what uh, this uh, you know industry career or the career in private uh, you know is really like. And that was a little bit of a process that started, in fact, in uh, in March um, uh, last year, 2020. And um, I think, you know, that was a good and bad because I had a little bit of time. We were doing a little bit of um, home office, of course, so uh, I could attend career uh, fairs and uh, I could speak with a lot of people. I do some informational interviews just because of, uh, you know, the amount of time that I had back uh, for myself and uh, to inform myself about career prospects. And um, what I also uh, decided and noticed with time was that uh, the topic is so big like, and uh, you know perfectly, right? So uh, in academia, they don't really, um, you know, explain you what to do next or if you wanna get attractive for industry. So that's why I got to, uh, you know, put together uh, my book, The Summer Olympic for PhDs that I was thinking was something like really useful for the community to um, kind of summarize a little bit some uh, aspects and, and tips to uh, start looking into a private, a leap into a private basically. And this was uh, then part of, the, of, uh, of my journey also back in the US. And what happened that was I was, you know, applying myself for uh, a bunch of jobs back, back in Europe because uh, I was, uh, you know, planning to come back uh, closer to home. And uh, to be honest, also the fact that uh, in the US also, if you want to have a career in private, it's a little bit of an issue because with a, with a visa situation you get, I used to get on this, I used to be on this uh, J1 visa and uh, that's a visitor, um, research uh, professor, uh, whatever kind of visa. And uh, you really um, kind of um, dependent on your sponsor. So basically back in the days, uh, what Cornell was my sponsor, my university sponsor, and I could not really, you know, uh, I could apply for jobs, but uh, it was, you know, obvious that I was not going to get it on that visa uh, I was having. So uh, I think um, also like with that, um, I was like a bit, I understood a little bit the system, understood the fact that if I wanted to stay in the US and have a um, kind of a career in private, I uh, really uh, had to invest uh, into a new visa, first of all, uh, like something like a green card or something like that, or an H-1B visa, just to be able to access uh, the market in such, in such regards. So I was like, hmm, since I don't see myself uh, probably uh, for such a long term, yeah, I really decided to just focus uh, you know, my search uh, into the uh, European market. And uh, what you know, I took a, a little bit of interviews and stuff, and uh, it, it was it was kind of a long process, but um, it was at the end uh, very successful. So uh, right now I started. Uh, it's been already uh, a month. I started uh, a position as a scientist in a discovery department at a uh, pharmaceutical company here back at the Vienna Biocenter. So it's um, so of course I had to uh, relocate back to Europe. So it was a little bit of a, everything was a little bit of a challenge with COVID still around and uh, and everything as we experienced uh, things very differently from the US to to the EU. Uh, but I think overall was a, was a very good choice, and uh, I'm really glad I did it so far. So I think um, you know. It was it was an interesting <laughs> journey, I, I'll say. Um, but um, you know, we will see where where it takes me next. So this is in a nutshell. <laughs> all right, all right, cool, uh, great. Right. So um, when when uh, you know, uh, did you did you re uh, uh, disclose to your uh, employer in the process that you offered the book about getting jobs or not? Uh, not really, actually. Uh, we, we didn't really talk about this. Uh, you mean in my employer back in the days in the US? Uh, no, your new employer. Uh, no, 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 not really. We didn't disclose that. Anyway, there was something hap that happened, um, you know, far before uh, my the start of my employment. So, right. yeah. I was curious, you know, if uh, being an author of such a book, it, does it actually help you in getting uh in landing a position or the opposite right <laughs> uh, yeah i'm not really sure that's a good question i'm not really sure to be honest uh yeah if that helps uh to be honest i didn't really put it on, on my cv mm -hmm. uh, 
that was not on my CV. It's on well, my but you know what happens, right? So every recruiter Googles you uh, these sure. days. So <laughs> sure. they, they, they probably found me. They probably found out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I should ask them actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm curious, you know, because uh, yeah. uh, I'm thinking, you know, if I was empl employing someone for the company and I knew that they are an expert on how to, uh, you know, how to get through an interview with flying right. colors, then how would I look at them? <laughs> oh, that's a good point. I, I will ask them, actually. <laughs> you gave me a good idea. <laughs> right. Okay, so um, uh, could you tell us a little bit more on your new job or is it still uh, a secret and you're not supposed to talk about it? Uh, it's a secret. <laughs> I'm not supposed to talk about it, but I can tell you a little bit of, uh, uh, I think, what I've been noticing so far. Uh, I think this will be uh, useful to, to the audience quite a bit. So I think uh, the main difference uh, I found out so far is that you know, whereas during my postdoc, my, my, my two postdocs and also my PhD, uh, what happens in academia is that you have uh, your own projects and you're like pretty much the only person responsible for it, right? So what happens is if you go on holiday, uh, it's not that, you know, your research is gonna uh, go on by itself, right? So you are pretty much the only responsible. Maybe, you, of course, you collaborate with colleagues, but not to such an extent, at least in my experience. And what I'm noticing already in uh, in industry is that we are really everybody's really pushing towards uh, one direction. So um, you know, I have my 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 part of the the project of uh, that really aligns with my expertise. But I'm really you know collaborating with, with with the other colleagues. We really I don't know share cell lines. So just to give you like an example, there was never the case. For instance, back in academia, everybody's got his own cell lines. Everybody's got their own media and stuff. So we're really uh, kind of, we work more uh, as a team. Um, and uh, I think that was the first big difference that I found. And um, secondly, uh, what well, uh, I can say, I think so far, I think somehow you feel a bit more um, valuable. <laughs> Mm -hmm. if 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 you understand what i mean so i think it's uh, it's th there's a little bit more um like respect for your role um whereas you know i remember also in academia back in the days uh, especially uh, you know, possibly during my PhD as well, you're not really uh, regarded as a high, like kind of a high skilled uh, workers. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think maybe it's uh, it's more the case uh, in industry in a private setting where um, you know people respect more your job. Uh, and I think possibly this is just my experience. It's it's uh, you know there's a lot of respect in academia. This I understand as well. Uh, but. I don't know, it feels like there's another uh, vibe around, there's another atmosphere, uh, so to say. And uh, also, I think uh, the work times are a little bit more structured. So it's a little bit more like of, of a nine to uh, five, nine to six kind of uh, job. Mm -hmm. And you can do your, your extra time or whatever, that's no problem, but it's your, your days a little bit more structured. It's not that, you know, someone comes in at 10, someone comes in at 11, someone comes in at 6 a.m. It's, uh, it's not like that. All the team is like sitting at the desk pretty much at nine. So that fosters also, I believe, collaboration as well, right? So mm -hmm. if, uh, you know, we all get in at the same time, we all, we all like a team and, uh, you know, we move, everybody moves towards like a common directions. Whereas what I found out also back in the days, also during my uh, postdocs, since everyone is so independent, uh, you know, they just come in whenever they want. If they get up at 10, they start at uh, 10 or 11. So I think that's something also that I like a bit more about uh, you know my experience so far, but uh, I'm kind of uh, fresh right now. Mm -hmm. So yeah, mm -hmm. but so far so good. So far so good, great. Yeah. Um, okay, so um, uh, all right, since uh, we cannot really talk about this topic too much, uh, then I'd like to ask you about your book. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, how did you take uh, the decision to, to write a book? And uh, from what I understand, it's your first book as well. Um, yes. So uh, you self-published, isn't it? Uh, if yes. I'm correct, so yeah. It was right. my first uh, non-academic uh, publication. 
Right. And um, yeah, I mean, it was a little bit challenging to like think about the audience as well. Like I was really targeting uh, post PhD or pre PhD kind of uh, kind of professionals, because I really found out myself uh, about this confusion about uh, you know kind of transitioning into industry. And you feel like I don't know. I think in Europe we are still kind of backwards in these regards. I mean, some universities are really uh, good. Also, also so in Netherlands there's some. Um, some universities they're really like uh, forward thinking in this regard so they try to put together some uh, uh, you know kind of uh, meetings and stuff where they explain people <laughs> what's out there right <laughs> for for them uh, but i think uh, especially back in the days uh, in vienna there was not much uh, buzz around it so i really like well after my phd i really had no idea what to do afterwards i mean for me it was just you know, I'll do a postdoc. It's just a natural development of things, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a bit of a shame. And I mean, uh, and myself, I had to go through it because I literally didn't know what what to do next. And uh, what 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 it would be like in an ideal uh, case scenario would be. Uh, really nice to know this in advance and know what kind of <laughs> skills really people uh, need in advance to get uh, and and also have a better overview of of the job market. And this was not the case for me so back in the day. So what I this I, I acknowledge this to, my, to myself and I understood that also a bunch of my colleagues, like the vast majority of my colleagues, were also like. In the same situation, they had no idea what to do next, and they were just, you know, in the hamster wheel of, you know, you go to work, you do your lab stuff, maybe you apply for grants, then at some point, uh, yeah, you continue that, and then once you uh, wake up, you're like, you know, in your in your forties maybe, and you've been doing like a bunch of postdocs here and there, and uh, yeah, it, so that was my fear because I was thinking that, uh, for instance. Uh, is it is it a waste of time or is it not? I think I think it wasn't a waste of time for me. I think the postdoc in the US was really a great experience, and mm -hmm. I will do it again, all, you know, all over again. But I really thought that um, you know I I I should have not you know transitioned into industry uh, too far you know ahead in my life uh, because you know it takes a bit of time to really adapt to new. Uh, working pace and also uh, new, uh, you, you know, organizations and stuff. So it's better if you do it. Uh, I mean, later than later. So uh, this came to the fact. I, I came to this realization very, very slowly, and then I was really like trying to push myself into uh, getting to know a little bit more about, you know, what kind of uh, industries are out there for PhDs, what kind of positions are out there for PhDs. I also uh, like in, encountered these much of uh, acronyms and stuff that they're really impossible to understand if you're not in the field, right? You know, the CMC scientists, quality control. I mean, I was like, what is this? And then, you know, you can apply for that. Obviously, no one is gonna, you know, <laughs> call you up because you don't really understand the meaning of uh, of uh, the job description, right? Because nobody's really, uh, you know, kind of explaining to you. Um, uh, also, like your mentor, if you know, is being only in academia, why? How would you expect them to be your mentor in in your transition, right? If they, you know, no idea themselves. Which is, I mean, it's it's fair. Um, I, I I'm 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 with that, but. I was like really trying to develop a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of uh, understanding on uh, how to approach like also my CV prepping, also my my interview and this kind of thing. So once I really put this much information together um, and I was really trying to push myself uh, out there and I really trying to attend as many uh, career fairs as possible. Uh, we were going, we were transitioning to online events. So it was really easy actually for me to uh, attend stuff like also on a tight uh, schedule. Mm -hmm. And also somehow people uh, on LinkedIn um, were um, also back in days, probably it, it was because people were more at home, maybe they had more time, I don't know, but they were, everybody was really, um, you know, willing to help and willing to jump on a call, like for a, a very short informational interview. And I remember back in the days, I 
uh, had my first informational interview with a with a girl from uh, that was doing a clinical research um, associate kind of role, mm -hmm. and I was like, mm, I don't really get what she does on the everyday basis because I was really still a little bit in between. Mm, shall I go fully non bench or really I should still work at the bench as a scientist? So I was really trying to understand the different uh, kind of position in the market. So I was having a lot of informational interviews and stuff with real professionals, like real life professionals. And what I did was just putting some notes on the site. Uh, I did some further research and then I really uh, decided to, you know, put this together in something that is a, is a bit of a funny book and it's uh, not really like uh, a romance kind of style. It's just more like bullet point kind of advice for, for, for your career. So I think there was overall like a funny journey itself uh, and, and it was useful first of all like for myself but also for other people as well to uh, you know hopefully uh, guide them a little bit through this uh, you know kind of bumpy um, path that is uh, your transition between academia and industry so that was my point also trying to help also others and my colleagues so and uh, in regards to the self-publishing stuff, um, yeah, it was it was kind of easy. I mean, uh, I did it through uh, Amazon, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, yeah, it was it, it was kind of straightforward. You just upload your manuscript after uh, did a bit of a copy um, uh, type kind of stuff um, to get it right, and then uh, I asked a designer to uh, to design my cover, and then. You know the the upload path on the on the platform was very straightforward so that was that was also good something like very seamless that i did not have to approach like a publisher maybe uh you know uh put some uh, money up front and stuff and so this was i think actually also a good idea for now but uh let's see if i if i'm gonna do it again <laughs> right yeah but i also choose to self-publish a book and I, okay. I think, uh, well, for me, it was, uh, I mean, I knew that in, in case of self-publishing, the, you know, all the burden of promoting a book is on your shoulders. So yes. that's the downside, of course. And but on the other hand, uh, there are also uh, benefits. And one such benefit is that uh, if you self-publish, then you don't need to wait. You can publish a book at the very moment when... Uh, when you feel that, like you're done with your manuscript mm -hmm. and uh, whereas with a publisher a publisher has a lot of control over your book so mm -hmm. I couldn't even choose my own uh, book cover and I know that my style is not what they like to see on self-help books because mm -hmm. uh, most self-help books is uh, just a title in like uh, you know capital letters like uh, some really, you know, a flashy cover, like yellow and red and, you know, just something that attracts yeah. attention straight away. And it's like, uh, I didn't like the style. I wanted to have my own style. And also uh, I knew that I don't want to be censored. I, I spent so many years in academia when uh, every editor and every reviewer could tell me how I should, uh, how I should rewrite my manuscripts. And sometimes I had to take compromises and introduce changes that i didn't believe were good ideas even but i had <laughs> this to time you were like i'll do it my my way <laughs> yeah my way my book my way i mean it's my life you know i was screwed by myself and i totally uh, agree with that <laughs> yeah. and um and i think it was a good decision it's a longer way uh, because again you're not supported by the publisher to uh, really uh, distribute information about your book um but it's um uh, but in the end, Amazon also has a global reach. Uh, it pays better. Uh, it's actually very friendly for authors because it pays better uh, royalties than most publishing houses. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so you, you get better deal and it's greener because you only uh, print books on demand. Mm -hmm. So there is no such thing as, uh, you know, stock of your books that is waiting for on the shelf to be sold, mm -hmm. but rather uh, you only uh, yeah it only goes to the printer once uh, someone presses the button uh, buy and mm -hmm. only then the book actually arrives uh, so i think yeah. it has so many uh, benefits for 
the environment and for you as an author then it's hard to just skip uh, over this mm, opportunity yeah absolutely. yeah and uh so yeah um i i i am happy also about my decision and i think if i uh, finish my second book which i'm working on <laughs> currently <laughs> nice. then I, I will do exactly the same so i will also self-publish as authors we can actually maybe agree on this point that uh, this is a good way uh, to try. And it's actually, I, I agree, it's much easier technically than most people think. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's actually surprisingly easy. So, the, I mean, it's never easy, but in this case, the difficulty is not in uh, releasing the book. The difficulty is in making people know that you wrote the yeah. book. Exactly, exactly. So yeah, that's a little bit difficult, the part of the right. self uh, kind of promotion, yeah, because you don't have uh, anyone like behind you backing, uh, right. you know, your your marketing, so to say, yeah. Right, right. Um, yes, uh, well, um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a long topic, but yeah. <laughs> I think it's also, if you want to uh, uh, build a name as, a, as an author, then most authors don't succeed with their first book. They just have to, you know, yes. keep on writing, keep on, I wouldn't say hustling, but keep on talking about it, keep on spreading the news, um, yeah. accept invitations to little talks, then to some mm -hmm. TEDx conferences, then to larger talks. And you just, uh, it's, a, it's a, a long years of development before you can call yourself a accomplished author and mm -hmm. that's, Something I was also not consider uh, considering when I was starting. I, I just like the process of writing. I don't know how you feel about it, uh, which part of yeah. the process is most uh, joyful for you. And for me, it's writing itself. So I, I, I did it for the sake of, you know, this creative process. But uh, then it turned out that 80% of the time is actually promoting what you do <laughs> and not writing. Yeah. Uh, that was uh, hard. I think yeah, I really, I really enjoyed it. Uh, you know, I can uh, resonate with what you said. Um, yeah, I, I really enjoy the writing process. Uh, so that's uh, really nice. And uh, yeah, you, you're very right with the stuff that you need to um, hustle a bit. Uh, but I think I really like the process itself because it gets you like out of your comfort zone a little bit and you get to speak and to know with a, you know a lot of people and this i think i find it wonderful to be honest i mean it's a it's a easy way to network with others and um it's always nice to get to know people to be honest. so it's like i really enjoyed the process so far and i'm sure i mean it's uh, it's the same for you right you get to speak with, with a lot of people get to know their stories and some are more interesting i guess some others are less but uh you know it's it's cool just you know to just speak to people right yeah 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 it's a like a bringing i would say the different dimension to your life like because you put yourself out there as an author and and mm -hmm. people start reaching out to you people who you never like heard of before and like 99 percent of this um like contact is positive and or maybe 99.9 once mm -hmm. in a while there is someone who thinks uh you're just a smug and too full of yourself and then uh, they try to spoil your day <laughs> but uh, usually it's actually only good stuff um, and uh, yeah I, I also think in general like I feel like I live life for real more than before when I was an mm. uh, employee yeah. uh, with, with the good and the bad uh, so it was a good decision, but it's also, yeah. it's a long, long run. It's like a marathon run, like many years of self-development before you can actually live off, com comfortably live off from mm -hmm. what you do and feel that, okay, I'm stable in this mm -hmm. type of... Uh, but I think uh, this is uh, anyway the case for any kind of self-employment uh, kind of work, yeah. right? Whatever you do, if you're a designer, yeah. if you're a graphic, whatever, it's like, yeah. yeah, at the beginning it's bad, but you are, you know, you decide the rules and uh, you're the boss, so which is pretty amazing if you think about it, right? Yeah. Yes. Ah, well, I'm, I'm a good boss. I know about you. But... <laughs> <laughs> Easy to say. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, I think, uh, well, I, I, 
well it's also that i i i uh, require a lot from myself that also mm -hmm. i don't um forgive myself as many mistakes as i forgive to other people so it's also sometimes a lot of self weeping indeed mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that's um but uh but i think yeah but still i think if you have that soul of uh, ent ent entrepreneur then you should definitely try at least once in a lifetime to see if if you would be happier this way yeah. Yeah, indeed that's true yeah. and what do you what do you think is your personal style of writing um so did, did you already like develop a style that you would you you can feel okay this is the style in which i will be writing my uh, other books in the future or you're mm -hmm. still on this uh self-discovery path i think uh, i i know pretty much myself writing. I think it's uh, very friendly and uh, very uh, uncomplicated, to be honest. Um, but um, yeah, what, what I think I'm not really good at, I think I'm not a good science communicator, although I really uh, learned in the in the years to like very much making or getting very complex uh, kind of things and data to like accessible uh, kind of vocabulary and stuff and i think this was very good uh, along my postdoc when uh, you know people from the outside the lab were asking me what so what you do right so uh, you need really to get uh, to the point without over complicating things and uh, that's uh, many times not the case with, with phds right they really lose themselves into details and stuff and it's all like and i was like that back in the days as well i can recognize it look looking back at myself back in the days but right. i think slowly I really uh, try to uh, be, you know, get more to the point and get more like summarized in an easier language uh, what I do and stuff. So I think that was helpful. But uh, yeah, as I said, I think uh, I, I'm probably like a, a decent storyteller, uh, but um, uh, and I think I can write about it. Um, I um, I'm, I think I'm, I'm really also like decent at summarizing stuff like uh, very analytic kind of ways like bullet points and things. This is, I think, easy for me, uh, but uh, I think I'm not really good at uh, probably doing a pure science communication. So you put me like in front of a paper and I need to tell you stuff. I mean, I, I'm able to do it, but probably it's not my favorite thing uh, mm -hmm. right now. So the psychom career is uh, is over for me already i think but uh this um writing uh writing the book itself i think it was it was interesting overall because it's not really you know science related so much it's more about mm -hmm. career and self development and i think i can i can uh, really resonate with that a lot and i think especially with covid we got uh really into that i mean we really got into uh, a bit of self-developing, -de also looking inwards at yourself, because of course, I mean, you cannot meet anyone, right? So uh, it was at the beginning, especially like something like you need to invest more time in yourself. And I think um, journaling was like something really that helped uh, me out, like in first of all, uh, trying to understand more myself and then uh, also like getting back into the writing because I, I you know I was keeping a diary and stuff but the you know everyday journaling was was really great for that apart from the fact that for yourself like it's you know it calms you down and uh, you know it's a good stuff to put uh, your day together and reflect on it and uh, reflect on the stuff you're grateful for but also reflect on the fact that that you can change the things that you didn't like that you want to change so i think this was also with covid was was a good thing so try to really you know uh, develop yourself a little bit better try to have a healthier life right so spend mm -hmm. more time outdoor right. like to sports and stuff and then the, it, this was related i think uh to to the book itself and to the writing like more self re reflections because you have less interactions and uh, less distractions from the outside right so um, i think that's that was really kind of related to that yeah right yeah i can relate I like, bet. Like writing is also that uh, type of zen mode activity and i completely forget about the time and sometimes <laughs> just one of these activities when I just sit down and after seven hours I realized that 
seven hours have passed. I thought it was half an hour and it was seven. So it's, um, yeah, I, I can relate. Uh, it's very it pleasant. You like it very much. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And to my demise, it's one of these uh, activities that are very hard to get income from, at least initially. Mm. It's so much harder than from writing code, for instance. I, I can code, but coding is the opposite for me. Half an hour passes, passes by, and it feels like seven hours. <laughs> so it's, <laughs> I decided, like, okay. regardless how well it's paid, it's just not something I will be doing. I just don't care, you know. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. No, I see what you mean. Um, if you don't enjoy it, it doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Right, right. Um, but actually, just re regarding writing, like I think that also uh, maybe uh, writing a book for PhD this is a good school of writing because PhDs are just demanding you know by uh, by uh, nature. by nature like uh, like we we learn to be critical and i think uh, if you can survive that <laughs> so if you can survive uh, reviews from phd's then you are set <laughs> yeah no this is right <laughs> right and i think that too like getting the right balance is really hard because on the one hand you uh, what phd's expect to hear is like uh, genuine like advice and information they they want to get uh, content out of it so you can't really fill in a book with just anecdotes because they what really they really expect uh, and they will just uh, you know point you Maybe. out if you if you don't provide that is is the content mm -hmm. uh, but it cannot be too dry on the other hand because uh, uh, like people lose attention very quickly so it's really hard for yeah. me to get that right balance and also the same with sense of humor so sense of humor like uh, making some uh, jokes or or indeed anecdotes it keeps people's attention relatively well uh, but it's not necessarily that they share your sense of humor and uh, and yeah. on the one hand it it makes most people happier but on the other hand it also uh, once in a while there is someone who completely doesn't yeah <laughs> buy it and um yeah. You have to make sure that it's um, it's kind of safe on the safe side. Uh, mm -hmm. Like uh, some time ago, I was doing a lecture for uh, one of the major Dutch universities, and and uh, and the organizers shared the feedback with me. So feedback from the participants, and there were like thirty people in the room, and there were only uh, like scores of ten or or one out of ten for me. Mm -hmm. So vast majority of people gave me like 10 out of 10 or 9 out of 10 and mm -hmm. like uh, one or two people gave me one saying wow. that my sense of humor is horrible and this is just uh yeah this whole lecture is uh atrocity and <laughs> they never <laughs> want anyone else to hear it again <laughs> oh my god <laughs> yeah so uh, it was funny but i was reinvited so i was like okay oh, yeah, <laughs> <Fair> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay so you risk if you use sense of humor, but yeah. And the second thing that is really hard to balance, I feel, is when you um, you have to kind of uh, at the same time, um, uh, well, ba balance facts and balance opinions as well. So if it's only facts and you get get give nothing out of like you yourself, uh, in mm -hmm. terms of like your own interpretation then it's just, you know, it's like Wikipedia, you know, it's just a yeah. bunch of facts. So you have mm -hmm. to kind of interpret what you learned and summarize it somehow and give your honest opinion. But I'm if sorry. it's too opinionated, then that's also not good. So mm -hmm. it's some like for me, it's also hard to get the right balance when uh, I, um, it's like some of your own contribution and interpretation, but it doesn't sound too opinionated. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that one? Like, is it hard for you to get that? Well, that's uh, what I wanted to jump in talking about. Yeah, it, again, storytelling, right? So it's it's all about it, and uh, I think that's uh, that's uh, first of all in the in the writing, of course, um, and uh, when while you're presenting as well, that takes a lot of storytelling and it takes a lot of exercise to get decent at that. Uh, but also that's something that is required most of the times in interviews as well. So I think uh, that's something that uh, anyone should really work on because it's um, you really, you know, it's really a skill, a soft skill that, uh, you know, in life is really needed. Um, yeah work life on private life. So I think that's, I, I can really, you know, 
yeah, I, I really agree with you. And uh, that's, the, I think it's, it's all about it. Like when you, while you're writing, while you're presenting, it's, uh, it's very important to like convey a story that it's, uh, that it, it resonates with your, with your audience as well. So as uh, you know, you were uh, talking about your example, and of course, probably some people didn't you know, didn't get your sense of humor. So you probably should have, I don't know, been a little bit more uh, cautious with that, more neutral, right? So um, to just uh, be like, um, you know, understand your audience a little bit better, understand, and that they, they would have also have understood you a, a little bit like in a, in a nicer way. But, you know, that's, I guess, uh, some uh, work that, you know, every one of us needs to do a bit, no? Right. Well, it's it's hard because if if I didn't uh, have a way of connecting with the audience, then I wouldn't get this uh, you know ten out of ten reviews either. So mm -hmm. that's, uh, that that's the point. Um, yeah, so to find this golden you know um, like this this point, yeah, golden middle, where you are like in the safe zone and you really engage people, like very hard. Um, but yeah, I guess it applies to the writing as well, right? So it's not yeah, just exactly. yeah, presentation. Well, for me, it's also like I came from blogging. So I, I started blogging at the second year of my PhD uh, on my of my master's studies. So it was like 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I kept on blogging uh, casually, first in Polish, then in English. And I think that's where my style, style came from as well. So I guess it's very different than it's much more casual straight away. Then, yeah. Uh, yeah, if sure. you... yeah. Okay, so um, maybe now since you're uh, also uh, an expert in career advisory for PhDs, maybe let's talk a, a little bit about uh, your general um, career advice that you might give to PhD candidates who are now thinking about the future and would like to make some decisions or take some steps to improve their career opportunities in the future. Absolutely. Uh, first of all, I'm not an expert <laughs> in career <laughs> advisory, uh, trust me. Um, you, you're obviously much more of an expert than me. Uh, it's just um, that... I think uh, we really like this episode, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. <laughs> I bet you do. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, um, I'm, uh, I, I've just been through it. As, as simple as that. So I, I can I can really uh, you know it's it's not it, it's not that my experience applies to everyone of course but I can tell uh, like looking back what's the mistake I was doing as well and I can see these mistakes in uh, everyone around me right so um, my my first thing like my first advice will be for sure like get informed like definitely get out of your like bubble lab kind of. Uh, you know, everyday routine. This helps a lot, and uh, I think I was there as well. Uh, I was I was getting really comfortable. You know, in academia, it's 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 a great place to be comfortable at because it's like yeah, you know, I get my contract every year. Probably next year, if I'm lucky enough, I get it for two years. Probably next year again, maybe I get a grant. So. I think it's a, it's an easy uh, like place to be sometimes. Sometimes it is not, of course. It really depends also on your uh, PI and everything. So the um, I think experience themselves they really change. Uh, it's it's really different. But mm -hmm. first of all, I would say yeah, pretty much you know get out of your comfort zone. Start talking to people. Uh, get this information and interviewing a little bit going because you really want to connect with new people outside your comfort zone outside the lab and also you want to know what to do next right so mm -hmm. that's uh, it's a win-win situation for everyone so slowly it's uh, for me also it took a bit of time to uh, get to know the um, you know the acts in uh, linkedin as well just on how to use linkedin on how to connect with people and uh, many people are doing it very wrong still nowadays uh, because it takes a bit of effort to be honest to just get in touch with people and to uh, like bring value in the conversation as well right so 
I think we have amazing, like very wonderful uh, kind of means to get in touch with people like LinkedIn and we can, we can uh, do cold uh, like messaging and actually uh, get uh, to some, uh, to have an informational interview or like very in, uh, you know, informal chats with these people, these professionals. So I think these are, you know, the two really basic things that I will start with. And uh, these are not granted. Because, you know, like a lot of people, you know, also looking back at myself back in academia, I wasn't doing that enough, obviously. So, and, uh, you know, if I'd done it back in the days, maybe right now, or like it would have taken me a little bit less time to do my, my career transition itself. So mm-hmm. definitely start with that. I think that's a very good idea to just get out of your bubble a little bit. I think in life, to be honest, <laughs> not just in career, right? So just uh, to try to uh, risk a bit to, uh, uh, you know, something new, to try something new, it's always nice. And other than that, I think once you started a bit this process of, uh, you know, getting in touch with people, um, maybe you attend some career kind of um, meetings or fairs that there's a bunch out there, like, and they're all for free because right now we are still all, everybody, everyone is on Zoom. So I really can, you know, attend a career fair like back in New York City. I mean, it's, that, that's literally no problem. So there's a lot that uh, it can be done in these regards by following of course influential people like for instance yourself and people that are really interested in and they think about i know you like it you like <laughs> this episode uh, i should no, like uh, be inviting to this channel <laughs> so, sorry say it again no i, I was kidding I, i'm just saying i should be invited for another episode <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's true uh no but you know people that generally really care about this topic and uh, as far as i understood like, um, you know, uh, you are one of those. So it's really nice if you can, you know, uh, people can follow you. I can understand a little bit, um, you know, what's, uh, what, what, what you're also offering and what you're talking about, or like just attending and watching these talks, for instance, uh, brings in a little bit uh, new perspectives, right? So I think that's something that can be done as well. And then once you are into this process a little bit, so this process started, um, I would say then uh, it's important to work a bit on your on the application material and uh, try really to understand what uh, your next challenge is like. So the next job is, uh, is, is like. So uh, yeah, also there like, yeah, if you want to become a science communicator or if you want to become a writer, if you want to uh, go into investing, uh, like banking, or if you want to go into whatever, it, there's, there's a lot of stuff that you can do with your PhD, of course. So try to really tailor and target that industry uh, and then niche, right? So uh, you would say, okay, I want to go into uh, venture capital for PhDs, right? So th- there's a lot out there, actually, a lot of like venture capital firms that are really, or consulting firms that are really uh, hiring PhDs because they want to understand, they want to uh, gain a better understanding on, uh, you know, the biotech kind of landscape or these kind of things. So yeah. um, you will think like, okay, well, Mm, you know, I just want to go into consulting. Uh, what is it like working as a consultant in, a, you know, as a PhD? You get in touch, you, you do like your search on LinkedIn, it doesn't take so much time. Maybe you, you, you do PhD and consultant or something like that. You find a bunch of people, you try to reach out. And then I'm sure at some point um, people like will be, okay, yeah, let's have a chat. And in such a way, you understand a little bit what the job is like. And if you really like it, maybe you can build some skills uh, towards that direction. So, and then uh, that applies to your CV as well. And, uh, you know, next time you see a vacancy that you really like, then you got already a decent material that you can apply for, uh, you can apply with, and, um, you know, you just really know what you're gonna do there. So, or you have a, a, you know, a better understanding of what you're gonna do. So I think these are the staples like, to start looking into, uh, you know, a, a leap into private. That's that's definitely the case, but there's a lot that can be done. And, uh, you know, that that's why they're also like a, a bunch of very good career 
coaches out there and uh, that they really help with uh, this transition because especially targeted and tailored for PhDs because it's, uh, it's, a, it's a special niche of, uh, of uh, um, highly skilled uh, kind of professionals that, that you know, they need to be sometimes, um, you know, you need to show them the way sometimes how to do things because uh, nobody's teaching us basically in academia. So that's, that's the core concept. Yeah. yeah, actually, I have to say that here in the Netherlands is slowly changing. So there are more and more PhD candidates who embark on the um, uh, onto graduate school with that thought in mind that they might actually finish their uh, career in science after PhD. And okay. I can see that there is a big like mental like shift towards uh, treating PhD as just the last stage of the education process and. Actually, I have a housemate who is now in the first year of her PhD. She doesn't even consider a, a career in science. She she actually she aims for PhD, and that also takes a lot of burden off, off from her shoulders because then you don't really have to, uh, you know, uh, struggle to to try to write another nature paper, but yeah. rather uh, focus on the skills you want to get. And I can also see that. The culture in academia also changed. Uh, so when I was starting my PhD back in 2013, uh, the first courses I was taking were academic writing, academic presentation, things like that, and uh, laboratory skills. And today uh, people start their PhDs from project management courses. And okay. you can see that uh, there is a big uh, difference there. And, uh, and, and here, indeed, in the Netherlands, um, universities tend to create their own career centers today and uh, try to incorporate um, transferable skills and building these transferable skills into the PhDs already. So that's a good change, yes. And about the networking, I couldn't agree more. I think that also some people like to, you know, say, uh, bitterly say that uh, they didn't land the position someone else did because they had a better network. And I mean, we all are born with the same network, which is zero, right? People who are better connected, they just made more like efforts to build their network. And yeah. there is networking and networking and you have to know how to do it properly. And this is not something you can build overnight. So it's, it's all about the way you make decisions in daily life. So one person on Friday night, one person will just... Um, you know, get a beer and sit in front of Netflix uh, for five hours and just, uh, you know, uh, binge watch a TV series. And another person will go out with a group of friends and just uh, call everyone and, and say, hey, let's go to a bar and chit chat. And then mm -hmm. those people eventually after 20 years, if that's your habit, then you will have much broader network than if you were binge watching TV series. Okay. So. It's, it's all about making everyday decisions smarter and not about, there is no secret that will all of a sudden, you know, completely change your game. You know, there is no one uh, winning a move that you have to make to make your network really influential. And uh, it's, it's more about the way you behave in daily life and make decisions about how you spend your time. Mm -hmm. and, and so, I think because also like this is also the advice we often uh, get right like we get this advice a lot that network but there are so many different ways of networking and sure. uh, and to make sure that your network is actually uh, built effectively it's like just completely different level of difficulty than mm -hmm. uh, just network but it's like uh, probably a material for another conversation but yeah, yeah. I, I totally agree with you it's it's such a important um, important part of the process so, and you can you can only just learn about yourself if you compare in some ways and you try to find people similar to you then then you actually get to know yourself better as well mm -hmm. yeah, I agree with you. so uh, putting yourself out there is I, I think very crucial to yeah. find your tribe yeah. okay uh, so on that note i would like to cordially thank you matteo for being with us today and uh, sharing your great insights and and your story with us and uh, to you guys who haven't seen the book the samu leap uh, please take a look i will uh, link the book here under the episode so please take a look at amazon and um, 
yeah and uh, have fun with it i hope you <laughs> you like the book and uh, thank you so much matteo for coming over and uh, thank you for having me thank you guys for watching if you would like to get more of this type of content please subscribe to the channel and uh, we would like to welcome your comments and questions so if you have any please post uh, below the video thank you so much and have a nice day